why so many people have been buying Rambler. Why Rambler was the only American car that increased sales in 58 over 57. Well, the reason is simply that Rambler is giving people what they hear that the Rambler is trim. Not too long and not too wide. They want a car that's... E I welcome this kind of examination. I am paying for this microphone. What difference does it make? I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! Well, I'm just a patsy. Not a Pax Americana, enforced on the world by American weapons of war. Grover, there's a cop beating up a guy. I'll be there. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. The United States is owned by foreign corporations. Do you really care? And if anybody cares, they're considered crazy. I have sinned against you, my loving man. All the humanity and all the... The is here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. An unspeakable tragedy. Dead on arrival. And I will go to my grave being at peace about it. Our long national nightmare is over. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. This is the Midnight Rider News Show with S.T. Patrick. Hi, this is Randy Benson. You're listening to the Midnight Rider News Show with S.T. Patrick. Hello, America and the world. Welcome to the Midnight Rider News Show. I'm S.T. Patrick, your friendly neighborhood host, traipsing through the trials and travails that have so tempestuously and untruthfully been blasted into your eyes, ears, and minds by the state-sponsored talking heads, court historians, and textbook conglomerates that control information today. Tonight, we have episode 075, Richard Bartholomew, The Rambler, and the Mac Wallace Fingerprints. Our guest tonight is researcher and new author, Richard Bartholomew, who will join us next in the Midnight Hour. First, however... A little cleaning of the castle. Now, I want to thank everyone who's joined us from the American Free Press website. We hope you'll check out our archives, which are free, by the way, at MidnightWriterNews.com. That's MidnightWriterNews.com. It really is a pleasure to have you all, and we hope that you like what you hear. Now, the Donate button is on the front of the website, so if you feel so inclined, and if you can help, we appreciate it very much. If you aren't in a position to do so at this point, thank you for considering it anyway, and please keep listening to the show. This is still a dream project for us, believe me, and we're so glad that you chose to join us on this stream. So we'll be right back with Richard Bartholomew. Hi, this is Joseph Green from JoeGreenJFK.com and the author of An Intro to the JFK Assassination Conspiracy. For more on the JFK assassination, download episode 28 of the Midnight Rider News Show. This is our third episode with new author Richard Bartholomew, and by the time many of you hear this, his book The Deep State in the Heart of Texas will be available for purchase, so please go out there and do that. Now, its release date is July 4, 2018, so as I said before, it should be available right now. Now, I can give it no finer compliment than to say that I believe it will be important. Richard has devoted his life to this research, and it's very personal to him, as it is to many. So... That said, we're going to go right into the question about the 1959 Rambler, and because of how these conversations were split into three episodes, there are no hellos, but to be sure, we're grateful that Richard has chosen to spend so much time with us, and it's an honor to have him back. So Richard, one of the more interesting aspects of your personal research is that you may have found THE Rambler used on November 22nd, 1963 in Dallas. Wow. <laughs> now, sometimes in life, I think history and fate and luck just converge, and this may be one of those times. So tell us about the Rambler, if you would. How did this happen? Okay, so we talked about my history growing up and becoming a JFK researcher, and I think we stopped around the time that I, I was working at UT, University of Texas, I graduated from there in 1980. A couple of years later, I was employed by them and spent 10 years there. By We talked about how in 1988, Bush was about to become president, his whole CIA background, the Hoover memo that Joseph McBride had uncovered was printed in the, in the Nation magazine. And I was aware of all this, and I said, oh my God, the, the CIA is about to become president. The coup succeeded. Uh, of course, it had already succeeded long before that, but this is this is what really blew my mind. It, it fi I finally got it. I said, okay, I'm just, you know, I'm wasting my time here. I need to develop an opinion about what happened with this. Like, I've developed opinions about any number of things. You know, I've been formally educated. I know how to study. 
it's time for me to crack the books on the JFK assassination, even though I'd read a handful of them and I, I had opinions. I really didn't know any details. So, 1988, and this is years before uh, a, lot of, a lot of guys, a lot of people around now who are JFK researchers, the epiphany for them was Oliver Stone's movie. This is three years before JFK, and it's, uh, and it's several years before anybody, before there's even any buzz about it. The movie. I'm just reacting to George W. George H. W. Bush becoming president. It was a, almost a certainty at that point. September of 1988. I start. I talked about how I went to Half Price Books and all of that, and found the bookshelf and started buying up everything I could get my hands on, rereading everything I already read, uh, reading everything else I could grab, and I built my entire library from that. By the end of it, I estimate I read for what became a de facto master's thesis. I read far more books than I would have had to read for an actual master's thesis. I probably read 100 books. By the time you read 10 books, you can pretty much tell who the liars are. So you're getting a grip on it after about 10 books. After 20 books, you're really getting a feel for it. And beyond that, I mean, you are... It, I tell people who are doing a lot of reading, I said, you know, you know what it's going to lead to, don't you? Uh, then people who do this kind of reading, they eventually are compelled to write about it. And that's what happened to me. But at the same time, I, I'm doing my initial reading, and I'm getting familiar with many of the uh, aspects, many of the details, many of the different stories, uh, the different lines of evidence. And one of them is the story of Roger Craig, the Dallas deputy sheriff, who uh, witnessed Oswald leaving the book depository running down the grassy knoll, getting into a Rambler station wagon that had pulled up to the side of the curb, going west on Elm Street, parked right there by the grassy knoll, and Oswald runs down the grassy knoll and he gets into this Rambler station wagon and they take off west towards South Oak Cliff, where Oswald next supposedly ended up at his rooming house. Of course, you know, then that didn't turn out to be the official version of Oswald leaving, there's a whole complicated, bizarre story that has been debunked over and over about him catching a bus and getting off the bus and catching a taxi cab, but not until allowing a lady to get into it and take the first cab in. He, he declines getting into it. Here's a guy escaping, supposedly, as a murderer of the President of the United States, and he allows a lady to take a cab ahead of him and he waits for the next one. Now, that's just nonsense, and people have done fantastic work on how Oswald left the early class. On the other hand, uh, and this is part of my establishing the conspiracy on page one, I talk about the six witnesses. More have, had turned up by then, even by the time John Kellen published this in Fair Play magazine. Uh, in the same issue that he published my piece, another researcher had, had found yet another witness to Oswald getting in this Rambler station wagon. And so we have a handful of witnesses, and I cite the six of them that I know about. And they're credible witnesses, the top one being the first and best one being Deputy Sheriff Roger Craig, an award-winning deputy sheriff, a guy who suffered greatly after he refused to go with the official story and he stuck to his eyewitness accounts. And so I'm familiar with the story, and I'm walking across campus. I'm going to a, a lunch spot that I occasionally went to, I'm taking a shortcut through the campus. All of a sudden, in front of me, parked in a um, handicap spot close to the building, is this old Rambler station wagon. And I'm going, hey, cool. That's a, an old Rambler station wagon that probably looks like the one that Oswald got into because of, because of its um, vintage. I didn't know what year it was at the time. I didn't know anything about it. I just knew... It was around 50s, 60s, early 60s, because it had the um, fishtails, the wings uh, on it, and it looked like a 50s car. So, you know, I just made a mental note of it. I went and had lunch. And, but it kind of stuck in my mind. And I thought, at first it was just cool. So every chance I got, I would walk by there and see if it was there, just to get another look at it. Well, eventually I start noticing there's some strange things about it. And after a few months, this stuff started being bizarre. I could not rationalize it away. 
And so I thought, you know, this car could disappear any day now. It's an old car. I don't know how well it runs. I don't know who owns it. And it could disappear any day. I should probably take pictures of it. And I had my camera. And I'm on the campus of the University of Texas, and I had been an art major, and I had taken photography. And it's not unusual on a university campus to see people walking around cameras and taking pictures of all kinds of things because you have journalism students and art students who do this all the time. So I'm not attracting any attention. Uh, and I have. You know, I'm hoping maybe, you know, the owner, I can run into him. I could ask about it. Um, admiring his old car. And so I, I thoroughly photograph it. And those photographs will be available on a dedicated website that's a companion website to the book. And I've always offered links to them, and I, early on I offered a CD with, with those photographs on it. So I thoroughly documented it in photography. Well, okay, so later that afternoon, I only have a, a, a shot or two left on the roll, maybe even just one shot left on the roll. And I have a little place uh, down... Um, not too far from where I saw it parked, across the street from campus, uh, where you can get your film developed. And, and so I'm walking there, and I'm on the campus side of the street, and I cross over this one street at 21st Street. Right next to, that's the very corner, Guadalupe Street and 21st Street, where the Harry Ransom Center is. That, that name <laughs> and that center plays a big part later in my monograph, but there I am standing at the corner of the Harry Ransom Center. I'm waiting at a, at a crosswalk, waiting for the light to change. And I look up, and coming down the campus, little campus side street there, out to the light at the very intersection where I was waiting, it's somebody driving that car. The old Rambler station wagon is being driven off campus, off of campus, although he's still on campus on this little side street. And I'm standing there. I'm the closest guy to where he's driving. And he's, and he, I know he's going to slow down when he gets to that light. And I have one shot left, maybe two. And I just, I don't have time to react. I just raise the camera and click the button. And, man, I, I just accidentally, I had it on the right speed setting. And, and it was focused and... I got this beautiful picture of George Wing driving his Rambler station wagon. I later found out his name in a bizarre sequence of events, let me tell you. Because, here, let me, let me just fast forward. So the bizarre aspects of the car, it turns out, and, you know, after doing all the research and thinking about this and all the details that I discovered that, that are documented in that monograph, I finally came to this conclusion that George Wing knew something about the JFK assassination. He began working at the University of Texas in 1962. He was older than most beginning associate professors. He was a Spanish and Portuguese student, uh, graduated Berkeley, got his degrees at Berkeley, and, um, and then got a, his first professor job at the University of Texas. And I talk about in the foreword to my monograph, by the time John Cowan published it, being the wise editor that John Cowan is, he saw that it's very, a very complicated story. And I'm not the best writer in the world. I'm certainly no Carl Oglesby by far. But John Cullen said, can you write basically an abstract that brings together all, all of these various pieces of evidence that you then start itemizing in a just ongoing way that becomes confusing? I admit it becomes confusing. And so I said, yes, absolutely. I've already started writing it. Uh, it needs to be done. And so in a, in, a, in a couple of pages, to three pages, I think, if you printed it out, uh, I wrote the abstract of what I think all the, the highlights of the evidence and the major aspects of it and the major players and names and what it all means. And I, I presented that in that version of, the, of it as a foreword. Joe may keep it intact that way. I know it will be there at the beginning of that piece in the book. It may be called an introduction at that point, instead of a forward, but, but uh, it's there, and it brings all of this evidence together, in terms, and some of it in terms of speculation, but less so than you would, you would call it faction. I think, uh, you know, I say that everything I say in that abstract 
is based on evidence. Uh, whether it came up later or that I ever published it at all, uh, it's in my notes, and it's there's actually evidence to support uh, all of these things. And of course, it's it's all of it is circumstantial. In fact, I, I discovered, like with many things in the JFK assassination, any piece of evidence. You know how Penn Jones said. Pick one thing and research the hell out of it. That was Penn Jones' famous thing for saying. Well, I picked the Rambler. And but like with anything, uh, the magic bullet, any person involved, Oswald himself, the closer you get to the core of that piece of evidence, it suddenly seems to split into multiples. And sure enough, that's what happened with the Rambler. Just when I thought, all the evidence was building. I, I was trying to eliminate this guy's rambler. I mean, who who in their right mind would think that here on the campus of the University of Texas is that very rambler that witnesses saw Oswald leave Dealey Plaza in, the, basically the, get, the getaway car? Who? Nobody in their right mind. And I didn't either. I said, it's just, it's cool to find a car that looks like it. But then I try to eliminate it, and I get the registration on the car. I found out who owns it. I found out who he bought it from. I found out who the salesman was. And immediately, LBJ comes into the picture. Close friends. It was a close friend of Lyndon Johnson's that, that George Wing bought the car from. A fellow by the name of Cecil Bernard Smith, who owned a, a, a couple of car lots and used cars in central downtown Austin basically the corner of, of Lamar Street and, and Fifth, you know, between Fifth and Sixth Street. And right across the street from where his car lot was, where this very car was bought, is now a bookstore called Book People that everybody around here knows. It's, um, you know, it's the preeminent brick-and-mortar bookstore in Austin. It's a venue for uh, book signings and things. You know, that whole area has, has changed drastically. It's no longer... Back then, though, and even as late as when I was here... And even as late as the late 80s, when I was discovering all this, I could drive down to that corner and I could see the old car lot. Uh, but no more. Now it's all gentrified and it's touristy and uh, shopping. Skyscrapers. There sits book people right across the street. And, and of course, Cecil Bernard Smith is good friends with <laughs> Lyndon Johnson. And I, I start interviewing people who knew Smith. And I, I discovered this that Cecil Bernard Smith was a big deal at the University of Texas. And, and in what area of the University of Texas? Well, Spanish and Portuguese. He was a Spanish student at the University of Texas. He studied with the great professors there of that. Uh, he was very interested in Latin America. Uh, he was instrumental in getting the Institute of Latin American Studies, the Benson Collection of Latin American Literature, at the University of Texas Libraries, he uh, was wealthy as a, as a used car dealer. And as a car dealer, he had the first Volkswagen dealership in Austin. And so he had bucks. He was, he was a wealthy guy. He donated money to the University of Texas. And they like you a lot when you donate money to a university. And so he was, he was put on the, the first, he was involved in the first board of the Latin American collection and the Institute of Latin American Studies. That has a fascinating history. No matter what direction I went then, you know, I, I don't know if you're this far. You've been doing this since about 1990, you said. So you, maybe you've experienced this. Once you grab on to a, a piece of the truth, you start finding other pieces of truth. It becomes a little easier to connect the dots at that point. And that's how you know it's a piece of the truth, because it starts connecting to other really true things. Uh, everything seems to be coming together. The dots start connecting easily. You don't have to stretch it. Uh, a lot of our detractors, a lot of our denigrators think that we stretch all this, that we make this stuff up. But no, these, the dots are there, and they're right next to each other, and they're easy to connect, and they do form the picture once you connect them. And you eventually learn that the more research you do in this. And so that's that's why I kept going, because it looked to me like you know, I had found a piece of the truth. I can guarantee you to this day, even though I stopped researching it on a daily basis around 97, 98 or so, 
moved on to a couple of other projects in JFK research, and then uh, and then had to start getting back to my life after that. And for the last 20 years, haven't done much, uh, or not been able to do much with it. Until recent years, I finally, you know, realized <laughs> that this is where I should be. And But anyway, back in those days, I'm, I'm finding out all this stuff, and it's all there. I, You know, I don't have an eidetic memory, a photographic memory like John Judge had. So I had to write it all down. This is how I dealt with it. I'm, this is massive detail. When you read it, you'll see the massive detail. Uh, because I'm going in all directions. I'm following, I'm following leads, and I'm investigating people, and I'm investigating the car itself. And I'm talking to mechanics who had to work on the car. I'm talking to people who had worked at C.B. Smith Motors, and I'm talking to people, I'm talking to the salesman's daughter and find out about his mysterious death. And everything, it just everything that you just cannot believe is the story turns out to be, actually be the exact story. So what the way I bring all that together is I say that even now, after 30 years of trying to debunk this car as the getaway car, I have not been able to do it, although I did come to this point. Uh, and, and it goes back to that whole thing, how evidence tends to split and dissipate the closer you get to it in this. And that's part of the propaganda. It turns out that there were at least three identical cars in Dealey Plaza picking up people, mysterious people are seen leaving the back of the depository, and they get into what well, turns out to be, I got the photographs, you know, people photographed, that's how I know it's three cars. There's the Bell film, there's film and there's still photographs of the parking area, of the side streets, and looking at all this material, this visual material, and knowing the characteristics of this car, like I do. Because, listen, like you said earlier, I, I, a lot of people don't know this, and I never say this in the actual monograph, because I was hiding even that fact of it at the time. We bought the car. There's a whole story to that, too, how we bought the car. Very interesting story. But we had the car, and we stored it for all the years that we had it. The story of what happened to it, I, bet, I, I finally tell that story in the book, uh, the final update of what happened to the car. People have always wondered, where is the car now? What happened to it? Uh, that's a fascinating story. We no longer have it. It's a fascinating story about what happened to it. But I knew that the day I decided to photograph it, I said, all right. And I was coming around to this realization. I, I was thinking, okay, what if it is the car? I'd better document this thing because whoever has this car, they're, they're, they, they have put it together as a puzzle. I came to call it a, a, da Vinci, a Da Vinci Code type puzzle that was there. Whoever had the knowledge and the inclination to figure it out, it would grab their attention and they would be able to follow the clues. He actually... He actually drew some of the beginning dots there. Well, not actually drew, but, but he had, and I, I detail all this, the, the fact that it was in original condition. It was old paint. It was old interior, worn, but original. It doesn't look like it had ever been renovated in any way, but it is an excellent, for an old, worn car, it was in excellent shape, and he drove it every day. And in the back seat were oh, these magazines, and, and I photographed them, and that photograph is available to see today. I lost track af after he died, the professor died. Amazingly enough, and there are coincidences, uh, but amazingly enough, George Gordon Wing, the professor of Spanish and Portuguese who owned this car, he died the day of the premiere of the movie, JFK, December 14th, 1991. Of course, he had been in bad shape. He died fairly young, but he had been alcoholic. He had been in therapy for it. All of this is detail. I even talked to, uh, uh, one of the things I did do in recent years, uh, maybe like four years ago, I got an opportunity to meet through a friend of mine who knew him, a mutual friend, George Wing's old boss. Not the guy that hired him, but the guy who replaced the guy who hired him. And the guy who knew him personally and knew the circumstances of his death and had lunch with him, and we went over all of it, and it still all fits. And so, so he dies, 
and I lose track of the magazines because at that point, they're no longer in the car. He was the one who kept them in the car. And they're old and worn, too. It's like they had been there for years. You know, he, they may not be original magazines, but it's not beyond, it's not beyond rational thinking that, that they had been there since he bought it in 63 because they were very worn and very old looking. They looked like they had been sitting in a back seat for 27 years or whatever it was. Of course, they could have been purchased at half price books that, that dealed in old magazines. In fact, I later went and found the very, the very mag- the magazines that I could identify in the stack. There's three or four in the stack, maybe five. And Some are on top, and some there you can see enough of them that you can identify them. And I identified them, and that's all in there, too. All of this detail is in there. And that's why it became a book-length monograph. You print it out on 8.5 by 11 paper, and it comes to 180 pages. And it's got like 150 footnotes and notes. And uh, so tons and tons of detail. And everything, everything kept saying, this is the cause. But like I said, it's I came came to the realization. I can't say it's the car. I can't say it's not the car. What I can say is it's one of three identical 1959 Rambler station wagons that were photographed in Dealey Plaza in the midst of suspicious activity at the time, within 10 minutes, both right before the assassination and within 10 minutes after the assassination. Those cars are witnessed in suspicious places, doing suspicious things, including one of those three being the one that somebody who was identical with Lee Harvey Oswald escaped the crime scene in the car. So there you go. There's the Rambler story in short. Richard, it seems sloppy on the part of the conspirators to sort of leave behind something that would be so widely seen, such as a 1959 Rambler station wagon. But I'm always surprised at the level of inefficiency in what appears to be intricately designed plots. Now, you would think that the guns, the shell casings, the cars, and yes, the fingerprints would all sort of disappear as part of the plot, yet they don't. In 1963, I'm guessing that there was even less of a concern. I mean, I highly doubt that the planners expected the public to pull highly pro-conspiracy for the next 50 years. So, you're right, it may very well be THE Rambler that you found. And wouldn't that be interesting? But also notable are the roles of the Paynes, Ruth and Michael Payne, in the Rambler story. How are they involved? Google Ruth Payne. You'll find tons of information. You'll find disinformation, but you'll find truth and stuff, too. She, within the research community, she's considered to be one of the conspirators. She, she is the lady, going back to um, the go signal of third week of April, 1963. I mentioned her before. Marina Oswald moves in with a woman named Ruth Payne. Her maiden name is Ruth Hyde. She comes from patrician wealth on the East Coast. She marries a man named Michael Payne. Michael Payne comes from the Forbes family. Again, patrician wealth on the East Coast. And, but here they are in, in Texas, living in a little, old, a little frame house in Irving, Texas. And he has a job at Bell Helicopter, a defense contractor. Much, much research has been done into these two. You'll, you'll see them interviewed in major documentaries on the piece telling their version of the story, of course. The bottom line with, with Ruth Payne is that it was at her house. So, someone even said this in a recent book or, or piece about her role in all this. But after the assassination, uh, that's where Marina had been living. Oswald had left from there to go to work that morning. Even though he wasn't living there with his wife, he was at the rooming house in Oak Cliff. He was visiting for the weekend and to see his two daughters, his two young daughters. And he had stayed there overnight, Thursday night into Friday morning. And he left for there with, with his ride to work. And two things. So Ruth Payne was instrumental into finding him that job at the school book depository. She, she said she heard it from a neighbor that the job was available. She passed the information on to Oswald. The other thing with the you have to know about Ruth Payne, tons and tons of CIA ties. And it was in my Rambler monograph 
Uh, I wasn't the one that discovered this stuff, but I was the first one to write about it and publish it. And it was based on another workshop that I had attended in 1991 at the first ASK conference with John Newman, the great military historian who's written extensively about Oswald and the JFK assassination. John Newman and Gus Russo, who was a, a researcher at the time, but eventually we came not to trust Gus Russo. Uh, but at the time, we were, you know, we were getting to know him, and, and here was John Newman and Gus Russo giving a workshop. And it's not really the topic of their workshop, but you know, these things start going in different directions, and, and they eventually start talking about this fascinating book called Autobiography of a Spy, authored by a woman who had been Alan Dulles's mistress in the OSS in Geneva, Switzerland. Not only that, she was his uh, liaison to one of the conspirators plotting the assassination of Adolf Hitler on July 20th, 1944. And she was Alan Dulles's personal, not only mistress, but contact with the conspiracy, getting all the updates and learning about what's happening with it. So this is Mary Bancroft. Uh, I wrote an entire chapter about her based on that book. I was the first one to give to give basically a book report on that book. So I learned about the book, and I learned about Mary Bancroft from John Newman and Gus Rousseau. And that's another workshop that I transcribed. I taped it myself, and I transcribed it from my own tape. And then I cite that transcript in that chapter. But the thing about Mary Bancroft is she was a personal friend of Ruth Forbes Payne, Michael Payne's mother. And they were, they were good friends, close friends. And of course, Ruth Forbes Payne knows the guy she's having an affair with uh, and knows her, her wartime history, everything, knows that she is Alan Dulles' mistress. And so here's a CIA tie. Only uh, two degrees removed. Uh, but, but, you know, and once again, Ruth Forbes... Young, she married a guy named Arthur Young, who's also a fascinating guy. Her son was Michael Payne, so she was Ruth Forbes Payne before she was Ruth Forbes Payne Young. And so it, it turns out that, that Ruth Hyde Payne, through the, the Quakers groups that she was involved with, lots of CIA ties there, lots of great research has been done on this. And to this day, because of the cognitive dissonance and the propaganda, both she and Michael Payne. In fact, I think Michael Payne just recently died. But I think she, of course, she's still alive, and, but elderly, and, and, but, not, but not out of the scene. I mean, uh, just in like a couple years ago, she was giving a talk at a library in California. You know, I had reports back in the mid-90s that she was in a nursing home. Now, you know, maybe she was in something like that for a while, for who knows what reason, but she's healthy, at least in the, Two years ago, she was healthy and out giving talks about her celebrity and all this. And she may be okay still, but I think Michael Payne did recently die, which is too bad, because these are people we need to subpoena and put them under oath and find out stuff. But that's Ruth Payne in a nutshell. And uh, because Marina was living with her at the time, her house... And Oswald stored, supposedly stored stuff there, including supposedly the murder weapon and a lot of other incriminating stuff, like, including weird stuff like, like a tiny camera, which only spies. I know you, you could actually buy it by then, but uh, in years prior to 1963, it was developed as a spy camera. It was a Minox, M-I-N-O-X, Minox camera that was developed for, for espionage during World, during World War II. And... But it was being manufactured for commercial purchase by 63. And, and in fact, I just recently learned and saw a video of this. That a friend of Jack Ruby's, or Jack Ruby himself had one, and was showing it to a friend that happened to have been filmed. And you can find this on YouTube. There's this, uh, one, of, one of the ladies who worked for Jack Ruby in his, in his carousel club, nightclub, a dancer, she was doing a promotional gig at a parade or something on a stage in downtown Dallas. And there was a, 
it was sort of a carnival atmosphere, and, and there was a crowd assembled watching the show on the stage. And Jack Ruby is at the front of the crowd, and his good friend is there. And you can see, as the camera sweeps by a couple of times, you can see Jack Ruby showing his friend his fancy new toy Minox camera. I'm very proud of it. Another dot, you know? You find a piece of the truth, and you start following it, and, and you find the other truthful pieces, and they lead to other truthful pieces, and that's how you know you're on to something. But Ruth Hyde Payne's house, hers and Michael Payne's house, although they were separated at the time, supposedly, you never know what's going on with CIA couples. Essentially, the research has conglomerated to defining Ruth Payne's house as the place where all the most incriminating evidence against Oswald was being stored in the Payne's garage. And there's even a book out there called um, The Payne's Garage, which is about this very thing. That's basically what we know Ruth Payne to be now. She and her husband, Michael Payne, were separated at the time. They were certainly babysitters, CIA babysitters for Oswald that had been handed over uh, from his previous CIA best friend, George DeMorenshield. This all happening after the go signal is given in the third week of April, 63. Ruth Payne was just right there and was instrumental in you know, making sure he was employed at the book depository and all kinds of, of stuff. And we know about their CIA connections and her, her husband's parents' CIA connections to Alan Dulles through Mary Bancroft. So, and you can read all this now in David Talbot's The Devil's Chessboard about Alan Dulles and his role in the assassination. Uh, he goes into Mary Bancroft, and others have, have written about Mary Bancroft. But I'm um, pretty sure, you know, my Rambler monograph uh, was the first to publish that story which I learned about from John Newman and Gus Russo's workshop at ASK 91. And then, uh, and then I actually found the book, found Mary Bancroft's book, Autobiography of a Spy, and read it. So it was out there at that point. I don't know if that's where David Talbot learned about it, but it became, a, it became an item of discussion in the research community after I started distributing. A first, back in those days, this is 1993, I was distributing the manuscript as an unpublished manuscript that was being sold by the major booksellers of uh, these items. Andy Winnie Arzik at the Last Hurrah Bookshop and Peter Formey at Prevailing Winds Research in California, uh, Last Hurrah being on the East Coast. And then, of course, in Dallas was uh, this new startup mail order place called JFK Lancer, being run by a guy named Tom Jones and Deborah Crouch at the time, eventually, Deborah Conway. And that's where Lancer, the name Lancer, came from, and it evolved into the JFK Lancer Conference that went on to replace the ASK conferences. And we're talking to Richard Bartholomew, the author of The Deep State in the Heart of Texas. He's the co-founder of the Center for Deep Political Research, and that can be found at cdpresearch.org. Now, one of my favorite speeches at the 2016 JFK Assassination Conference was Richard's. And in it, he gave an impassioned presentation about Mac Wallace and a box found at the Texas School Book Depository. Now, we're going to let Richard tell the story, but I'd first like to ask if Mac Wallace had any personal ties to the Texas School Book Depository? Okay. So, um, my answer to that question, I tend to want to preface everything you just said, but I will go ahead and directly answer your question. My answer to that question is no. Now, a lot of people, there's a lot of buzz about Wallace and his fingerprint that was supposedly found on one of the boxes that made up the sniper's nest on the sixth floor where supposedly Oswald did his alleged shooting. And that's true. A fingerprint exists. But I said in the speech, or at least in the Q&A of that speech, that and certainly in Alexandria where I first gave the first speech, I gave two speeches on it. You heard the second one. I think I said it in that speech too. But the point is, the evidence does not take you all the way back to a box on the sixth floor. These fingerprints were obtained from the National Archives 
uh, the so-called unidentified fingerprints. Full history on that, the Warren Commission gave all their doc FBI documents are in the Warren Commission, 26 volumes of evidence. And you can, you can go to the archives and you can look at these commission documents, which were originally FBI evidence, the fingerprints. And there's the identified fingerprints and there's the ones that are called unidentified or unidentifiable. There's several categories they used. Turns out, though, we found out in 1997, I was associated with a guy named John Fraser Harrison, J. Harrison, and he was working. I didn't know until later. He would tell me he was working with a very important person on, on this investigation of these fingerprints. But I learned that it was Barr McClellan. Barr McClellan will eventually put this evidence into a book called Blood, Money, and Power. And the book, you know, it's not one of the best books. Sorry, Barr. I see Barr at the conferences. I talk to him. We, we go to dinner together. I think he knows that the book is considered to be flawed. But let me tell you this. And I told him when I saw him recently in Washington, D.C. at a conference. I said, you know, Barr, that appendix, the one about the fingerprints, the evidence itself, uh, that stands to this day. Because when I was writing that, those two speeches, I went back and I reread the appendix. And I knew at the time, I knew in 1997 when we were finding this evidence and I knew that it was Barr that was uh, collecting all of this research for his book. I, I started, be, when I read the first draft of his book, uh, I was one of the first ones to read the first draft of his book. I was hired for the purpose of going over it. And so was Jay Harrison. He subcontracted to me. I say that I, he did eventually pay me a couple of hundred dollars for way more work than that's worth that I put into this. But, you know, I, was, I politely accepted it. And I, I still have, I'm glad I saved those checks because people later tried to say that, that I'm lying about all of this. Of course, they, they shut up pretty quickly after I posted those, those checks and uh, other proofs that I was involved in and all that. I, I kept a detailed record also. Because Jay Harrison, we called him Jay, John Fraser Harrison, former reserve officer for the Dallas Police Department, in 1963-64, and on the ground doing actual, being sent out on investigative work in the aftermath of the assassination from day one. I met up with him September 1st, 1994. Uh, I was introduced, I mentioned this in the last, in the first part of this interview, I mentioned that John Slate, who was a librarian at the Barker Texas History Center at UT, introduced me to Jay Harrison, who would, who would always come to that library to do his research on the Warren Commission volumes. And one day he was there when I was there, and John Slate introduced us. John Slate now, I didn't mention this before, but John Slate is now. I told who he was then, and his claim to fame in the movie Slacker. But he is now, he later became, when he graduated with his library, his information science degree, he later became the archivist for the city of Dallas. For many years now, he's been the Dallas city archivist. The guy you go to if you want any records on any of this, on the assassination of Dallas police, he's the guy. So, you know, that's good karma. And so he introduced me to, to Jay, September 1st, 1994. And so this is, now we're up to 1997. I've known uh, Jay for three years. We were in constant contact by either phone or email chat group which in those days was list server or email or in person. He would often call me and say, I got something I want you to see. Can you, can you come down here? And he was a good, you know, 15, 20 minutes away from me down the freeway. Uh, it was more in central Austin. And I was northeast in a suburb called Pflugerville. But, you know, uh, we, were, we were pretty tight as far as collaborators. I had helped him on some personal things, too. At the time I met him, he was actually homeless. He was living out of a out of his step van on a friend's empty lot off of Highway 183 in North Austin. And because he had lost his shirt in the real estate crash of 2000, well, well there were not 2008. The 2008 was a big crash, another big crash. But there was an earlier downturn in real estate. And he had been working with one of the largest real estate firms in Austin at the time. That's way he was making his living by then. He had, he had been in a lot of high-tech stuff. He had worked for he had worked in printing and he had worked in, in high-tech. 
uh, early days of high tech. So he knew computers. He did his own programming. He built his own computer. He had his own computer. He programmed in DOS. Uh, he, he even had a little setup in his van. The guy was resourceful. He really, uh, even though he was homeless, he was not destitute. And he, he was getting his pensions and stuff from his military service. He had been counterintelligence, army counterintelligence, like a lot of guys that I ran into during the uh, Korea years, I suppose, I guess it was. And so um, I helped him out by, you know, putting him in touch with a friend of mine who had a driveway who, you know, his friend that he was on the empty lot wanted him to move his van off of the lot. He had more other plans for the lot. And this is what was happening when I first met him. And, and so I arranged for him to, you know, move the van and live in the driveway of my friend uh, Stephen Bright in central Austin. And I, I give all these locations. I give the addresses and the update and the final update of my Rambler piece in the book. I give the final locations of all these places, which were totally, we kept it totally secret at the time. Only a handful of people. But strange people would still show up at the house. Let me tell you. And why did they show up the house? Not because Jay Harrison was living there in his van, but because that's where we stored the Rambler. When we first bought it, we took it and we parked it in that driveway. And that was an old, that neighborhood were old frame houses from the 40s, early 50s. And boy, did it blend in well there. It was, we hid it in plain sight. And boy, did it blend in. It was totally camouflaged. It looked like it belonged there. And yes, yeah, and I tell in the updates to my Ramaphys, I tell the story about the strange people that would show up there and get suddenly very interested in that car. So that's who, that's Jay Harrison. And, and then he got me involved with Barr McClellan. Let's get back to the fingerprint. Jay Harrison will go down in history with all the, the st research he did on the assassination, which we will eventually see. His files exist, and we will eventually see the work he did. That's been difficult because of who has the files now, but we're not going to go there. That's a pet peeve of mine. And he knows who he is, and so do other researchers, and so do you. But we're not, I don't want to go there. What I will say is that we will eventually see Jay Harrison's files. I'm optimistic of that. But at, at this point, He's working with Bob McClellan on his book, on the first draft of his book. And it was Jay. I don't know if it was Barr or Jay who had the idea to go look at these fingerprints. But Jay got a hold of the, um, the actual Warren Commission documents, photographs. What you get are you get photographs of the actual latent prints that the FBI collected in their latent FBI fingerprint file on the case. And you can request photographs of those uh, pieces of evidence from the National Archives, and that's what Jay did. And he got all of them. He didn't get one or two, one or two exhibits. He got all of the existing FBI fingerprint latent prints that were developed, and he identified which files were the were the ones that were called unidentified or unidentifiable. And he decided that, well, let's just double check this from the FBI. Who's going to trust the FBI this late in the game? And so he he got. A fingerprint examiner. This is this is uh, mid 1997, uh, and before I even knew anything about it, it wasn't until September of 97 that he revealed to me that he had found he had matched one of these fingerprints. So, a couple of months prior to this, he goes to a fingerprint examiner that he finds in Austin, and he does the that fingerprint examiner does the first analysis of the prints. And he does it the way you're supposed to do it. He does it blind. He doesn't know anything about the cases. Matter of fact, Jay was telling the story just to keep it secret, so it wasn't it, so it would not influence the examiner. And that's the way you want it. You want a you want a blind analysis done. And what he would say was that he was a genealogist, which he was, and he wanted to find out if these fingerprints were the fingerprints of somebody he was doing genealogy about ancestry. And so that was the cover story. And so the examiner, you know, he's just doing what he's always done every day. And he, he takes the exhibits and he takes the fingerprint card. Jay had also uh, was the guy who went to find, he knew that Mac Wallace, the guy we're talking about here, Malcolm Everett Wallace, he knew that Mac Wallace had famously been convicted of murder in 1951. Oddly enough, for the murder of 
Josepha Johnson's boyfriend at a putt-putt golf course in Austin. Cold-blooded murder outright. In broad daylight, in front of witness. Took out his gun and shot this guy, Kinzer, John Douglas Kinzer, who was the, the clerk at this putt-putt golf course, who happened to have been dating Josepha Johnson, who it turns out is the sister of Lyndon Johnson. And a sister of Lyndon Johnson that, if you read Robert Caro's works, and now if you read Phil Nelson's books on this, or if you just listen to your show that you did with Phil Nelson, Phil does an excellent job just going over the details of this, especially this episode. And I thought he did a great job. He really knows, he re, he's really done the research and he knows this stuff. And so, if you want, I, I would send you to that interview as the quickest, easiest place to go. Listen to Phil Nelson's interview by you, S.T. Patrick, in that show, uh, for this story. And so that's the murder. And, of course, he's arrested. He's put on trial for murder, first-degree murder. He's convicted. And, and Phil goes into the details of that trial. But to this day, you know, as, as, as recently as maybe, you know, a lot of the people who were around then have since died off. But I was still running into some of those people in the old parts of Austin. There's some old diners around here that I like to go to. And I would I would go up to the bar and, and order my meal. And, and if there was somebody of a certain age there, I would try to have a conversation with them about, you know, old Austin. And at some point I would say, hey, do you remember, you know, uh, that whole deal with Mac Wallace and the, the murder at the Peter Pan putt-putt golf course in 51? Oh, yeah. Oh, man, they're what? They're to a person of that age who was around then an adult. Let me tell you, it was a big deal. It was like the trial of the century for them. Uh, it was OJ on the local scene. It involved Lyndon Johnson. It involved Mac Wallace, who was, I mean, the OJ analogy is not, not really off the wall here, except that it was local Austin. He, was, he had been the student body president of the University of Texas. He was kind of a big deal. He, he was on his way politically, and Phil goes into that, too, and does an excellent job of that. But this was, this was a well-known guy in Austin that did the murder, and he killed Lyndon Johnson's sister, who was an embarrassment to Lyndon Johnson. Yeah, Phil goes into all that, too. This is who Mac Wallace is in 1951. But he gets off. He gets a five-year suspended sentence. The details of that you can hear in that interview. It's all very, very strange and suspicious. And when, you, when I brought it up to those elder Austinites, in those diners, they were livid. To this, to that day, they were just, you could see the anger building in them, their blood pressure rising at the nonsensical nature of that trial. They knew it was a fixed deal at the time when they were reading it in the paper. And to this day, they were just livid that Johnson got away with it. And this plays into what I said in the last interview about how Texans who'd been in Texas for a long time by the time of the Kennedy assassination they knew this history. It was This was local Texas history. And so at the time of the assassination, the first thing that came, I said that the first thing that came to people's minds who, who have been longtime Texans, Lyndon Johnson had to have something to do with this. They knew Lyndon Johnson, and they knew it from stories like the Mac Wallace conviction and how he got off and how they knew that it was probably through Lyndon Johnson. You know, his lawyer, you'll hear in the Phil Nelson interview, his lawyer was Johnson's personal attorney in that trial. So he gets a five-year suspended sentence. At the end of the five years, he, probation, the, the judge dismisses all charges. So he, his, his record is cleansed. He's no longer a convicted murderer. He, gets, he then gets a job as a, at a major defense contractor, uh, Ling Temco Vought, Vought, or whatever it was called at the time, eventually became E-Systems. Oh, boy, that plays into it big time, too, E-Systems. Because suspicious things happen at, at the local uh, e-systems plant in Garland, Texas. And guess when these suspicious things happen? They happen in the third week of April, 1963. And I write about this in one of the updates to the Rambler piece. The HSCA, the House Select Committee on Assassinations, their investigators were digging into this. I found where they were, they were getting the documents and reporting them. They were interested in this. But like everything else with the HSCA, it didn't play out. They didn't end the investigation. But they got the original, the original diagnosis, which was a flight plan 
of David Ferry. Now, apologies to novices who don't know who David Ferry is, but he's one of the conspirators. He's one of the suspects in the conspiracy to assassinate Kennedy. You get a good dose of who he was, is when you watch the movie JFK. But David Ferry, they have a flight plan uh, filed by, by David Ferry flying from, I believe it's New Orleans, to the Dallas area. But he lands at what is termed a landing, uh, an airport in Garland, Texas. Now, I talked about how I, I grew up in Garland, Texas. I graduated from Garland High School. I rode my bike all over town back in those days, which you could do then. And so I knew, I knew the, the layout of the town. And I knew that there was no airport in Garland, Texas. So when I discovered this flight plan from a David Perry flying to Garland, Texas in a private aircraft, I said, wait a minute, there's, where could this be? There's no airport. There's, there are little airports around the area. There's one out in Addison, another suburb. But that's quite a ways away from Garland. And so I did some research into it, and it turns out there is there was a little airstrip in Garland, Texas, and it was at the defense contractor E Systems on their property, up near near a place where I went to junior high school for a time, and um, and lived at an apartment complex just on the same street. And uh, I never knew because you couldn't see the airstrip from the street from any angle on the street but you could get aerial photographs, and I did, and I saw the airstrip and where it was. That's where the flight plan said David Ferry landed, at ESA. And here's Mac Wallace. Uh, after his five years suspended sentence and on probation, getting cleared, gets uh, through his connections with Lyndon Johnson again, gets a job at ESA, as a defense contractor, which requires security clearance. And, of course, I think that plays into how he could have made it to Dallas at the time of the assassination. Uh, he could, so it's logical. He could have been in Dealey Plaza at the time. Now, another thing, you asked about placing him on the sixth floor where his fingerprint was found, or supposedly found. I don't, I don't say it was found there. It was found, his fingerprint was matched to a latent print that was found in the National Archives in the files of the FBI's latent prints developed, supposedly developed from those boxes in that file. That's where the fingerprint was, where Jay found it. Anybody who says that his fingerprint was on a box, now you can trace it to a particular box through the commission exhibits, the Warren Commission exhibits, and I did. We know, we know which box it's claimed to have been found on. Uh, and there are photographs where the FBI has circled the parts of the box where, where those prints were found on. And it all makes sense because uh, knowing which fingers, there's more than one finger. Let me emphasize that. Let me stop and emphasize that there's more than one finger involved here. When you look this up and you go to the forums and you see people talking about this to this day, they talk about a single fingerprint, and that's because of something I protested at the time I first read Barr's manuscript and even the appendix that I talked glowingly about, about the fingerprints. They decided, Jay and Barr decided, with my protest, to only deal with one fingerprint. But there were, there were three fingerprints, all matched to Mac Wallace by that first examiner in mid-1997. By looking at the fingerprint card, that first there was one, there was a fingerprint card that was unusable that the Austin Police Department had. But Jay, they knew it was unusable because it was badly, it was badly made. Uh, and there were just nothing more than smudges. He showed me the copy he had of that fingerprint card. And... And it was like if you had put your, your thumb in coffee and then tried to make an impression of it, and it was dripping. It's a smudge, and those are the smudge fingerprints. But they were never used because Jay, when he found them, he said, these are, these are unusable. But he knew a, a possible second location. There were, uh, there were other locations. But Mac Wallace was military. Phil Nelson talks about all this. Too. And so the military takes your fingerprints. He was a... He was, had security clearance at a defense contractor. So the FBI actually had his fingerprints. And to this day, probably still does. Right? And they had them in 63. Yeah, but we're not dealing with that at this point. Jay, the second most convenient place to check is the Department of Public Safety, which is the state police, headquartered in Austin, Texas. And so he calls them, finds, uh, has them checked. Yes, they have 
a fingerprint file from Mac Wallace, and he's continuing his little cover story about how he's doing genealogy, and he needs to take a look at this fingerprint card. Could he get a copy? Could he get a certified copy of it? Now, they, they start giving him all this legal ease about how, unless he has standing in some legal matter involving this person, he can't get a copy. He can't get a certified copy of the fingerprints. He starts a letter writing campaign back and forth with his contacts at the DPS. We call it the DPS. And he, he eventually wears them down. He, he's very persistent. And in a matter of months, he wears them down uh, and gets his certified copy of the DPS fingerprint card, which it turns out is in excellent shape. It was done well. It was done professionally. These are good, clear fingerprints. Now, he gets a certified photocopy. And by 1997, photocopying technology was at a state where it's good. It's almost as good as the original. And I can tell you this because I am a graphic artist, trained and, and educated, and was a professional at it for, for decades. And I know printing technology, and I know photographic imagery technology and photocopying. And I saw the evolution of it. And I can tell you that by 1997, and I was doing pen and ink illustration work, and I would have clients like you know, magazines and newspapers that have to reproduce it. In the old days, before photocopying, you had to send the original artwork. But by then, the photocopying was good enough that you could make a good photocopy, a first-generation photocopy of your artwork. And it was good enough because it's going to lose a little bit of quality when they print it in the magazine or newspaper anyway, but not enough that anybody would ever notice. So it's high-quality photocopying. And that's the, the quality of photocopy that that Jay Harrison got from the DPS. And these are good fingerprints. And the first thing Jay had me do, because I'm a graphic artist, I have a computer system that does graphics. This is still the early days of computer graphics, 97. But I, had, I was doing what you could do then. I had a buddy who could do even more, because he, worked at, he was an engineer at Motorola, and he, he made a lot more money than I did as an engineer at Motorola. And he had the latest equipment and the latest, he could burn CDs. Your average person couldn't burn CDs in those days unless you bought expensive equipment, and he had that equipment. And so between the two of us, we did high-resolution scans of that fingerprint card and of those latent prints. The raw materials, Jay was handing over to fingerprint examiners. And to this day, those images exist. And if you know anything about digital scanning and digital imagery, you know that the the digital images that you can get copies of from me to this day, those images don't lose quality. You can photocopy something over and over for several generations, it loses quality. But we scanned at high resolution, the highest we could at that time. We, and we had limited storage, too. Even my buddy, Mike Blackwell, who real long-time researchers will remember Mike Blackwell from the days of the ASK conferences, and he hung out at Dealey Plaza, and he was everybody loved Mike Blackwell. And he was... A good guy and serious, and he became a friend of Ed Hoffman, blah, blah, blah. I won't get distracted. But Mike had greater storage capacity, and he had the scanners, and he had the ability to burn CDs. So when I failed to get good imagery off of my computer at my house, I called up Mike Blackwell. He said, sure, bring him over. This is all documented. When we did it, the hours we spent on it. In my uh, timeline that I submitted to Barr that resulted in his small checks to me. And those, the, the point is, those images, I still have them. And they will be put up in the dedicated website that goes with my book. And you can download them. You can, you can get the links to where you can get them today. And I've off, at, in my speeches, I always offered them. Many researchers have, I've sent them to who were interested. Only a handful of people really go to this level to where they want to see these images. But I can tell you that James D. Eugenio uh, got a copy of them. Joan Mellon, I sent her copies of them. Uh, you know, what they did with them is uh, another story. Whether they understood what they were looking at is another story. But let me tell you, I understood what I was looking at. Because the one thing I point out in my speeches on this, and it will be, these speeches will be published in their entirety in the book with the documents. 
uh, and what we can't what we can't get in the book, we will put on the website, and you can download the PDFs of all this. And you can, and I encourage everybody get these images and look at them yourself. Get a good book, or go to now you can go to YouTube and just look up fingerprint examination, fingerprint science, and get a really good introduction about how it's done and what you're looking for, and the terminology and how it's done. And you can get a basic understanding of this. Now, you will not become an expert. You will get an introduction. And let me tell you that and this is done every day because I found out that at the Department of Public Safety in Austin, Texas, they have a whole room full of fingerprint examiners that they hire who are not certified. I mean, you don't start out as a fingerprint examiner as a certified examiner. Certified exam certifying an examiner is just something that's done for the law. And even when you're certified, that doesn't mean you're any good at it, really. It just means you're good enough to take their little test and get certified. And I've looked into all of this. And having your certification update is only for being an expert witness in court because, the, you know, that's how you become an expert witness. But you don't start out as a certified examiner. And, and it really, it's like having a driver's license. You're not a NASCAR driver, your driver's license doesn't mean you're a NASCAR driver, or a stuntman behind the wheel, an expert driver, uh, a commercial license, yeah, you're a little better, you drive other vehicles that require a lot more experience, but even still, that doesn't make you the best driver in the world, because you have a driver's license, same thing with being a certified print examiner, it just means that you've taken a test, you passed it, you know, whether you passed it with an A or a C, yeah, you passed it, and now you have your card, and now you can be an expert witness in court. That's all that means. But with that, some people go on from being amateur, novice examiners. And that, like I said, DPS has a room full of novice examiners. And I worked with one uh, when I worked at the local library. They hired a lady. I got to know, you know, who she was, and she had another job that she was always having to go to after the library job. It was the night shift at the DPS as a fingerprint examiner. She wasn't certified. She was just part of the room full of people who make a first pass judgment on these things. Now, in the days of computer identification, yeah, they can put the, com the fingerprint, the latent print on the computer, and they can have the computer scan but the computer only comes up with a selection of possible candidates for that fingerprint. And at that point, humans have to take over. And it's not like you see on CSI or NCIS and that magic that you see on TV. The computer doesn't match the fingerprint. The computer comes up with a general selection of possible candidates. At that point, it goes to that room full of people and several it's like proofreading a book. You know, there's a room full of proofreaders at a publishing house, or used to be anyway. I have my doubts these days, the editing that's done. But it goes from one person, and they narrow it down. It goes to another person, and they narrow it down further. And it goes up the line and eventually ends up with the most senior guy who passes on it, and it's the guy who's certified who can then go to court and be the expert witness on it. And so Jay made sure that he not only went to a certified examiner, but one with a lot of experience. Now, we don't know who that first person was in mid-97, unfortunately. Jay didn't tell me at the time, but I had the work that he had done, and they were in the original appendix, the draft appendix on the fingerprints, uh, the exhibits that Barr had for his book that I did my first reading of and notations on. He had those original prints. Because this is, you know, I'm reading this in October. I get my copy of his manuscript and the exhibits in October of 97. And then we have November to, to read the manuscript, the text portion of it, and the exhibits, the, appendix, the appendices, and make our notations about it. Because we're going to meet with Barr. We have an appointment to meet with Barr in his Houston office in December, in early December. And so... Uh, I'm studying this because at this point, I'm saying, okay, Jay has given me this material. He gave me, he, he gave me the first generation, the copies he had, first generation copies uh, to do the scans from. And I also had second generation copies, which were still really good in those days because I had to give them back the first generation copies because they were valuable and 
And he had to give them to other examiners because, let me tell you, even though I never got the name of that first examiner, uh, there's a reason for that. He was the first examiner to set, to, when he found out, he did the study blind and he made the matches. Three, he matched three fingers on one hand to four latent prints that were somewhat hidden by the orange. And I talk about all that in those speeches too that you'll read. I, I, de I developed a detailed chart, a, an annotated chart, where I show you how many prints were found, who they were identified to, which ones were Oswalds, how many were Oswalds, how many were the FBI's, and, and then I show you how many were these latent prints and how they were labeled. They were mislabeled by the FBI as unidentifiable or unidentified or fragmented or whatever. I give the terms that they use in this one-page annotated chart that's called Conflicts and Official an official documentation of the of the fingerprints of the cardboard carton prints, and that will be in the book too. You can look at that, and it gives you all the references to the fingerprints from the Warren Commission volumes and the report, and it tells the whole story of how they hid these prints. Conflicts in official accounts of the cardboard carton prints is the official title of that monograph, and. So I'd studied, and I did this for my own purposes because I wanted to understand what I was looking at here because I'm a, I've always been a very careful researcher. And when you start collaborating with other researchers and you start learning that maybe they're not as careful as you are, you don't want to get wrapped up. You don't want to spend a lot of time doing something that's going to be a waste of time. Or I certainly didn't. So I started really trying to determine if I could actually see the match. And being a visual thinker, having a formal education in visual thinking and in art uh, and having a natural talent for it and, uh, and because of a visual brain, I thought maybe, you know, you know, novices start doing this all the time and, and some people are talented at it. And I wanted to find out if I was. And so by the time we met with Barr and we went over all of our, our, our notes about his manuscript, Barr gives me a new job. He hands me the FBI manual for fingerprint science. And he says, I want you to read this and study it. And I want you to be my troubleshooter because people are going to attack us because of these prints. And so get as knowledgeable as you can about it and be on the lookout for, for these attacks and, or, or anything that we might do wrong or warn us about any mistakes that we might make that you see. So I said, fine. And I take the manual, I go home, and I read it, and I study it. And at this point, you know, uh, I understand what I'm reading. I've done this over and over. I did it with, with the styles of illustration that I did. I did it when I went into feature film animation. I did a couple of years of that. I read the books first. First you find out, do I, can, do I understand the books? If you get to that point, then you have to test yourself with real work. And so I looked at those original matches again. And I, I looked at the, at the counts that they did from the center and all the ways that they, they determined what, what minutia is a match. And I understood what I was seeing. And I said, okay, this examiner, I can see some of these matches having learned how to do it. Now, I'm not as good as an examiner. I can't do it quickly or as well but I can do it. And I convinced myself that, yeah, I can see most of these matches. There's enough here that I agree this is a match. Now, if I had gone the other way, and if I'd said, I can't see this, I can't understand this, or I can see it and I can see that it's not a match, then I would have said to Bar and Jay, I would have said, all right, count me out. I'm stepping away at this point. I don't think it's a match. And I don't deserve to be working with you on this if I don't think it's a match. And just for my own conscience, uh, I shouldn't be doing it. But no, it was the other way around. I saw the match. I could see it. And from that point on to this day, I can, I can say with confidence that it's a match. Not everybody can. Not everybody can see this. Not everybody has the cognitive ability to do this work or see it. Visual thinking is a very strange thing in the human brain. And there are 
I use the example of face blindness. There are people who can't recognize faces at all. They have to depend on, you know, is the person's hairstyle and glasses and clothing. 60 Minutes did an excellent piece on this once. There are people who can't, can't recognize your face. They have to go by other clues. All the way up to what they call super face recognizers. And this is a spectrum in everybody's brain. Everybody's different somewhere on this spectrum. And the same is true of all visual thinking. You know, it plays into this uh, fingerprint science. And so being, and I took 60 minutes little online test and it determined that I was a super face recognizer, which didn't surprise me because my forte in drawing had always been portraiture, drawing and painting. I was good at portraiture. So I knew I was good at likenesses. And I even went into cartoon caricature, which you really have to know likeness because you have to exaggerate the likeness and it has to be recognizable to uh, other people after you do it. And I discovered that just, again, by reading up on it, do I understand the reading, and then actually doing it, and found that I had the knack. So I tested myself. I studied it, and I tested myself. Did the same thing with the fingerprints. So I was confident, and I'm confident to this day that what I'm seeing is the match. And so whenever somebody else, and they did come along, other people did come along and say, no, this is not a match. Yes, they did. They, uh, the first was the FBI, because in that meeting with Barr and Jay in Houston, I was the guy who said, you know, I, I found out that Barr was, uh, it, my impression was that Barr was very excited about writing this book. And he, he had visions of it being a bestseller. And his wife came into the room at some point, and she was like, practically giddy about the prospects of this book being a bestseller. Fine. That's fine. But I, I brought them back down to a level where I was, which was, gentlemen, we are talking here about evidence in a murder case. Now, if we sit on this evidence for the purpose of publishing in a book, for profiting from it, we could legitimately be accused of obstruction of justice. And I'm talking to a super lawyer, a former super lawyer in Austin, Texas, about this. And I, I'm kind of not believing that I have to explain this to Barry McClellan. But that shows you that how both Jay and Barr, their cognitive grasp of all this was that, as we discussed earlier, was this thrill-seeking celebrity mode kind of stuff. Not the reality that we're dealing with a man's horrible gunshot murder that is still, that is still an open case. Exactly, and I don't think that the public still sees it as a murder case, and I know the historical establishment fails to see it that way, but I think respecting this case enough to still see it as a murder investigation is important, and when we just see it as a textbook history story, it denies the event the horrible realities that actually occurred in Dallas. But we're now talking about the fingerprint, one of multiple as you described, and I want to go back to that 2016 conference and something you said earlier. Now, you sent the evidence to both Jim DiEugenio, who we've had on the show, and to Joan Mellon, whose book Faustian Bargain, to some, is an apologetic ode to the Johnson family. That's what some have said. Now, you talked quite a bit about Joan Mellon in that speech, and in fact, many of the speakers took shots at Joan. It was, it was quite the topic du jour those three days. But it still seems that there are researchers out there who just don't buy the link to Mac Wallace. And I know you had a lengthy correspondence with Joan. So why do you think there's still such resistance? Uh, well, of course, in JFK research, you will always get people who give you the counter argument that defends the Warren Commission, that accuses Oswald. That you know that going in that that's going to happen. Will it make sense? No, it will not make sense because, as I said in my Gordian Knot essay, uh, you know, they've never had a problem with being wrong about this stuff. Uh, it doesn't have to make sense, and uh, it, none of it does. I mean, going back to the single bullet theory, I use that as an example, but you can, you can pick any piece of evidence, and you can show this as an example, that their explanation makes no sense once you, once you know the evidence. Now, why do people believe this nonsensical stuff when it's so obviously nonsense? Well, I go back to authoritarianism. Authoritarianism is a very... A, a very pervasive kind of mentality that's hard to break out of for a lot of people, for most people, as a matter of fact, because, you know, we get it from childhood. Our, our parents are the authorities. In order to live your daily life as a child, 
you have to be authoritarian. You have to accept what your parents are doing. And those who, who cannot do that, where there is parental abuse and such, it causes major problems. And that's, but by and large, most people grow up with a good childhood, and, but it's based on this authoritarian mindset. It's a, the parental model. And so authoritarianism is ingrained in us, and, and I, I explain a lot of our politics in this country through authoritarianism. So in, in terms of top to bottom and bottom to top, uh, why people believe authorities, to this day people will listen to the evening newscast and they will be lied to through the entire newscast and they will believe it. Or they won't believe it, but they won't admit that they don't believe it, and that's the authoritarian. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more, and I say this all the time, but most Americans claim that they don't believe the media, yet when they want to show you that something absolutely happened, they reference the news. And we do the same with teachers, and as you said, we do the same with parents, and politicians in the capital S state would probably like us to throw them in the mix as well, and, well, we probably should. But more specifically, I was referencing not the Oswald Act at alone crowd. There's not a lot we can do about them at this point. They've just chosen to be wrong. I'm talking about those in the JFK research field who do believe that there was a conspiracy. Is it is it just some sort of innate defense of Johnson because they're already on record as downplaying LBJ involvement? Or do they legitimately not buy the fingerprint science that's been presented to them? Specifically, what do you think about Joan Mellon's denial of the fingerprints? She wrote a book, Faustian Bargains, and my speech is about, my second speech was, was my critique of her fingerprint chapter, chapter 17 of that book. Uh, I leave the rest of the book to others who know the whole Mac Wallace story better than I do, but I've communicated with some of them, and they see similar biases and flaws there that I saw in that one chapter. But all I need is that one chapter because I can see the match. I know it's a match. And anytime I read somebody who says it's not a match, if they will show me their work, I will be able to see where they went wrong. And, of course, I was easily able to see that with uh, Joan Mellon's book. Now, I waited a couple of years for her to publish those conclusions. I had heard two years prior, she would started going out on, on public speaking tours and talking about how she had determined she had had this examiner do a re-examination and had determined that it's not a match. But she never talked about the details. She never, she never showed her work. And I said, well, and, and some, of her, some of her supporters and people who were helping her, they would contact me and they would want my response to what she was saying in, in public. And I would say, well, you know, I, I don't know what her evidence is. Saying you have proof is not proof, is what I would tell them. And I said, okay, I'm going to wait for the proof. I'm going to wait to see the work that was done. And then I'm going to determine what's going on here. And so I waited you know, two years. There was word that it was imminently about to be published. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't going to be published. I don't know what went wrong. I don't know if the publisher had problems with it. Or, if, you know, there were legal issues that had to be resolved. But finally, two years later, it was published. I got a copy of the book right away. I went to the chapter, started reading it. I said, oh, my God. You know, six pages into it, when she started giving the details of what the examiner did, first of all, she, let me, let me just say that Phil Nelson graciously read a summary I did of that speech. That I call it the 10 things Joan Mellon got wrong about Mac Wallace's fingerprints. And I sent it to Phil Nelson in advance of your interview of him. And... He graciously read, read them on, on, in his interview, and you can go listen to him do it. I could go over them as well. Well, sure. Let's do that. Let's go over the list of 10. Okay. So, Mellon was wrong that there was only a single fingerprint. She actually said there was only a single fingerprint collected from the six floor boxes. Well, my monograph, Conflicts in Official Accounts of Cardboard Carton Prints, which you'll read in the book, shows that there were several collected, several unidentified prints collected. And I just told that story. She said there was only one. So she's, she's extending the myth there was only a single fingerprint, unidentified print collected. Uh, she was wrong that box A, you know, we know it as box A, was, this, was sitting at the edge of the entrance 
of the sixth floor. She said that box A, the box where the prints were supposedly found on, she said it was sitting at the edge of the entrance to the sixth floor. Well, if you've studied the floor plan, you know that the entrance to the sixth floor is in the other corner from where the sniper's nest was, the alleged sniper's nest. So that didn't make sense. And she was wrong that the Department of Public Safety, that it was those inked prints from the Department of Public Safety rather than the Austin Police Department's. She, she in, her, in her writing in that chapter, she constantly conflates the Department of Public Safety inked prints and the Austin Police Department's inked prints. She, sa- she thinks they're one and the same. She doesn't understand it. And let me tell you that in 2013, I consulted with Joan on all of this. She, she called me when she started doing this research on this book about Mac Wallace. She found out about my role in all of this, and she called me to her credit, and I told her about Jay Harrison. I told her uh, about the whole fingerprint story. I sent her the images, the digital images, and went over all of this with her, and we spent three months going back and forth in email, and I sent her CD-ROMs of this stuff, and we discussed it, and I could tell at the time she wasn't understanding this, and I told her, how I came to understand it and how she could too. But after, at the end of it, we split ways because she never, she never understood the details of what I was telling her. And it was she who chose to part ways. I was, I'm very patient. I was willing to keep helping her, even though it was frustrating. But I kind of, you know, I almost came to this feeling that she didn't want to know what I was trying to tell her because I had explained I had explained it a dozen different ways, simplifying it each time. And let me just be brutally honest here. A a big part of the split between us at the end there, I won't tell you everything that happened. I'm still keeping that somewhat private. Some researchers know the story. But uh, she, she actually accused me of changing my story. But I knew that was a possible accusation from the beginning. When she, when she rephrased the, when she asked the question for like the third and fourth time, and I had to come up with how can I simplify this further, I knew that there are certain con, con men out there, con people, who will re-ask, and, they, and police do this in, in interrogations too. And I've seen it done illegitimately and corruptly, if you know how this is done in interrogations. They will ask the question over and over, and you will... You will want to, you will have to re-access your memory on it. The memories are not perfect, and you may get a detail wrong. That's what they want you to do. But I was aware that that was possibly the trick that was going on here. I'm not saying that was what was happening, but she was asking the same questions over and over. And I have all the emails, so, you know, I could prove all this. And I would try to simplify it, but I was careful enough to not simplify it in terms of changing it in any way. So I didn't simplify it much, and I, I somewhat sympathized with her. If she really, truly was not understanding it, it was because it, it can't be simplified any further without endangering the information, the data. So I was patient, and I kept trying to help her. And I was willing to go over it the same way again, but then she finally accused me of uh, changing my story. So then I, I thought, well, she act, either actually believes that or that was her game from the beginning. Uh, and I have an instinctual feeling about what it was, and we'll move on. So we're, we're up to item three. Okay. So, uh, oh, no, we're still in item two, unfortunately. So she conflated the two different. The Austin Police Department's, which were, were actually smudged, and the Department of Public Safety's prints, which were high, excellent quality, even though they were photocopies. In, 19, in 1997, an unnamed original examiner that we just talked about followed, the 1990, followed in 1998 by Darby, Nathan Darby, was the, was the second examiner to do it. Then by Hoffmeister, Eric Hoffmeister, was the third that Jay went to to do this. Now, the first guy didn't want his name involved when he found out it was Mac Wallace. The third guy didn't want his name involved when he found out it was Mac Wallace, and it was more Hoffmeister's wife 
who was handicapped and in a wheelchair and said, you know, what if they kill you over this? What's going to happen to me? And Hoffmeister, being a longtime good husband, you know, he, he went with his wife's wishes. Even though, even if he had been, you know, a brave guy himself, his wife made some good points. And he went with her, which wisely, I think, he did. My whole beef with that thing was that why did Hoffmeister's name eventually come out? Why did, why did Barr put it in his book when he had asked that his name not be revealed? That's my only question about it to this day. I never revealed his name. Uh, I knew it at the time. April 1998 was when we were dealing with him. Jay was livid that he didn't want to go through with it. But we, we had, we had uh, Darby. Hoffmeister was only going to be a secondary ver- verification of Darby. Not that you needed it, because Darby was, had 50 years' experience, and he was a certified examiner. We'll get to that in a minute. So they used only the DPS roll prints, which were excellent quality. Joan got that wrong. She thinks that they were smudged prints and that the Austin police prints and the DPS prints were one and the same. Couldn't be more wrong about that. Uh, she was wrong to talk to Mac Wallace's son, Michael. Mac Wallace's son, Michael, who was still alive. And Michael gave her a weak, uncertain alibi for his father's whereabouts that day, the day of the assassination. But she ignored Nathan Darby's son, who was a pastor in Austin. Steve Darby. He's a minister, a pastor at a church in Austin. And Joan was consulting with my friend that I mentioned earlier, Don Meredith, who lived, who happened to be a neighbor of Steve Darby. And Nathan Darby was actually living with his son in his son's house, just, you know, a few houses down from Don's house at the time. And Joan was consulting with Don. So Joan had a perfectly good way of getting an interview with Steve Darby. And Steve Darby would have been thrilled to do it. Because when the book came out, and I sent the copy of that chapter to Don, first thing Don did was call up Steve. And, and, and then the whole issue of, of Joan, it's later in the list, but Joan accused him of not being certified, but swearing an affidavit that he was certified at the time, which is liable. It's posthumous liable, but it's still liable slander, at least, and, and Steve said back to Don, you know, Joan based this on supposedly a note that had been written and put in Darby's certified print file that he was not certified at the time, and Steve said, well, let her produce that note, because I know for a fact that my father was certified, that he was religious about keeping his certification up to date, even in the advanced age of his 80s. So Mellon got that wrong. Uh, she didn't interview Nathan Darby's son, who's a pastor in Austin, that she had an easy connection to. But she went to the trouble to find Mac Wallace's son in California and get this kind of weak, uncertain alibi of where, where he was. So Steve has always been absolutely certain that his father kept his certification up to date. Okay, the next item, she was wrong that her examiner's work was blind. His report, you can see, you can see his report in her book. And I credit her for actually showing us the work, showing us the report. But everything she said about her examiner's report, she she got it so wrong. She didn't understand what her examiner had done for her. So she got her examiner's, the fact that it was blind, wrong as well. His report calls it the Warren Commission exhibit and the Wallace print. Well, when you're doing it blind, up through and including your report, you're not supposed to know where these prints came from or whose they are. And that was the case with Nathan Darby. It wasn't until after he issued his match that he was told. He gave his report that they were a match, that he was told that they were war. It had to do with the assassination of Kennedy, and it was Mac Wallace that was identified. And so uh, she was wrong that it was blind. By 2013, when I was dealing with her, And when she was dealing with this examiner, the examination was required to be at least double blind. Uh, And you see this, if you know science and the scientific method, you know about blindness and double blindness and even triple blindness. Her reanalysis was required to be at least double blind to hide Mellon's known interest in the assassination. Joan had written books about Jim Garrison. All you have to do is look up her name. 
But here she is giving her examiner her name, and her examiner could just you know, Google her and find out that she writes about the Kennedy assassination. And now here I'm, you know, you have to question, you know, how much did he know about these prints as he was examining them? You, you cannot even have the impression of blindness here. There cannot be any accusation of lack of blindness in a scientific study like this. And it's all over the place in this. Um, so the lack of scientific blindness alone invalidates Joan Mellon's reexamination. She was wrong that her examiner, Robert Garrett, agreed with her that the DPS prints were smudged and unusable. She's conflating again with the Austin prints. But she says that her examiner agreed with her to that they were smudged. Nothing to be further from the truth. Garrett said the prints, he said this, you can read it in his report. Garrett said the prints were usable, and he used them. Only one of the 20 DPS prints, a flat one, there's two different types. There's a flat print and a roll print. There's one print that's a flat print that was unusable in the high-quality DPS print card, and nobody ever used it. It was unusable, and nobody ever used it, and nobody ever talked about using it. That's the only case where this even comes close to what she's saying. Garrett not only didn't agree with her that the DPS prints were smudged and usable, he said they were usable, and he actually used them, something that examiners do not do. The first thing they assess, and I'll talk about that later, is that very thing. All right, she was wrong not to give Garrett the high-quality print copies Darby and the other original examiners used. Still, Garrett could have compared the lower quality DPS print to the higher quality Warren Commission exhibit that she did have. And he could have seen the match, but he didn't. Instead, he compared two low quality enlargements of Darby's working charts. Something that's just, you know, of course, Garrett couldn't control what she gave him. And of course, she's paying him to do this. And he's doing it on a freelance case. He, he deems that these are quality enough stuff. They're low quality, but he thinks they're quality enough to go on with his examination. But he could have compared the low quality DPS print he had and the higher quality Warren Commission exhibit, and he could have seen the, the match, but he didn't. Instead, he compared two low quality enlargements of Darby's working charts. The thing about charts is when you make charts where you're going to mark, you know, you're going to draw lines on it, and you're going to write notes and numbers where the matches are, that is not examination material. Those are working charts, uh, but that's what Joan gave to Garrett, and that's what Garrett used. The authenticity, the next item, the authenticity of the alleged Wallace military print that she gave to Garrett. She had gotten a U.S. Navy. Uh, Wallace was in the Marines, and she found a U.S. Navy print card. That is somewhat suspect, because there are features on it that, that are different than what Darby was working, the one Darby was working with. Was it forged? Uh, maybe. Who knows how things like this can end up in a U.S. Navy file. You know, we, we know the FBI planted all kinds of weird stuff on this case. So you have to be suspect of it. But it turns out that there, there could be an innocent explanation for this because these were older prints than the 1951 prints that Darby was using. And as prints age, just like the rest of your body and your face, little changes can occur. And every time you take an impression of a fingerprint, uh, if you know anything about printing, and especially printing soft things, there are differences. But aside from those differences, which examiners know to recognize very well, there are, there are age differences that can accrue. And so it could be as innocent as that. But bottom line is those the prints that Mellon gave to Garrett that are Wallace's military prints, they have to remain suspect because of those differences, How, whatever the explanation is for those differences. Now, the last two items. She was wrong that Garrett concluded the Warren Commission print belonged to someone else entirely. She said that. She said Garrett concluded the Warren Commission print belonged to someone else entirely. He didn't. Simply put, what Garrett concluded was that not all the materials he was given for comparison were high enough quality for him to see, in his opinion, in his opinion only. 
They were not high enough quality for him to see Darby's match. That's all he said in his report. That was his conclusion. And you can read it yourself in Joan's book. So here again, we have Joan showing us the report, which we can read ourselves. And then we have her in the text of that chapter saying something completely the opposite of what's in the report. So she's, not, she's either not understanding or she's absolutely trying to lead you down a narrative, a false narrative path. So last item, all of this makes Mellon's claims junk science. Taken all together, everything I just told you, it makes Mellon's claims junk science. Garbage in, garbage out. But even with the match, the match I've told you that I see, that I know is a match, it's wrong for Mellon or anyone to believe it puts Wallace on the sixth floor or his hands on those boxes. The provenance of the Wallace prints goes only as far as the Warren Commission's FBI latent print file where they could have been easily planted. And we have dozens of cases, at least dozens of cases, where the FBI skewed and planted evidence in this case. And so, now, let me add one other thing that I didn't say in, in here. Even if you do take the prints all the way back to the boxes, uh, it doesn't put Wallace, and I said this in my first speech on this, it doesn't put Wallace on the sixth floor at that sniper's nest because you think about, well, all kinds of ways his prints could have gotten on that box, and then the box gets up to the sixth floor without him even knowing that the bo what the box is going to be used for. Suppose he is at E-Systems, a, a company he works for in California, but he is sent to the Garland plant, suppose, let's suppose he was, that was his reason, that's why he was there. Suppose he's there at his job, at his, at his employer's plant, and suppose his employer or supervisor says, hey, hey uh, Mac, come on out here and help us load these boxes into this car. He doesn't have to be told what the boxes are, where they're going, and what's in them. He's just being told, here, grab that box and hand it to me. And at that point, his fingerprints are on there for 24 hours. And if it happens that morning, that box is transported over to the book depository and taken up to the sixth floor. It could have easily happened that way. You cannot say, you cannot use this fingerprint match to say, even if you can say, which you can't, you, even if you say his, these prints were actually on that box, you can't say that he put them on that box on that floor because there's a lot of covert ways that they could have got his prints on that box and then got the box up to the sixth floor. So that's all I have to say about that. It may be speculation, you're right, but all we can do is really speculate at this point. Right. And one thing is for sure, though, if we were ever to place Mac Wallace on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository on November 22nd, 1963, then it instantly changes the story of two people. It changes the story of Lee Harvey Oswald, and it changes the story of Lyndon Johnson. And at that point, either Wallace is an accomplice of Oswald, which seems highly unlikely since the evidence against Oswald itself is so flimsy, and I don't know that many people have ever linked the two together, so we can roll that out. It could also mean that Wallace was there and Oswald was not, which to me seems more likely. Now, what does it mean for Lyndon Johnson? Well, the LBJ absolvers, and and I won't use defenders, I'll say absolvers, the LBJ absolvers would have a hard time explaining that away. Now, they would try to explain that away, to be sure, and they would probably say that Wallace was there, but not under any instructive orders from LBJ, because if there were orders from LBJ, then this is proof of his involvement. But as you said, those would be if-then scenarios, which we can't prove at this time. But we do have Wallace on a box, and that alone seems to be somewhat mathematically impossible. So when that became true, I think it opens the door for many unanswered questions to be legitimately asked again and then probed again. Well, yeah. Uh, there are other avenues to this. I'm just talking about the fingerprint. I'm saying that to say the fingerprint puts Mac Wallace in the sniper's nest is wrong. It doesn't. You're, you are going beyond the evidence. But there were witnesses to a guy on that floor handling those boxes, d good descriptions of him. And guess what? His physical description matches Mac Wallace. Roger Craig and other witnesses identified the driver of the Rambler that Oswald supposedly got into. Guess what? His description matches 
the guy that was seen up on the sixth floor, and it matches Mac Wallace as well. When Roger Craig, Jim Garrison, developed some information identifying that driver, I just want to say that, because others will point that out, uh, as someone else. So great, you know, that's good. But still, even even that person uh, bears a resemblance to the way Mac Wallace looked at the time. So there's other avenues, and, you know, it's very logical and very realistic to ha- to put Mac Wallace in the area, you know, and and if you can do that, then you can, without having him on the sixth floor, you can you can get his prints on the box. So there's that. And there's many, many, once you start delving into Mac Wallace himself, there's many, many other pieces of evidence that add up to him being involved in this in some way. Yes, and as you noted earlier, I would refer people to Phil Nelson's work on Mac Wallace, which I think is very good. But Richard, if you can put Mac Wallace in Dallas on that day, then the next question is still, why? Yeah. So, well, even if he's not, uh, you have his print in the very FBI file, latent prints that were in the sniper's nest. So you have that. That's that's a fact. That's for sure. Now, so why? Well, you know, you you have you have a president like LBJ, who's is an integral part of a coup d'état, who becomes the successor president. And of course, you don't become president unless you can be compromised, certainly not since the assassination. Every president since then can be compromised in some way. I declare many times that you, you're not even allowed to run for president unless they can compromise you, unless, they, unless you can be manipulated when, when it comes right down to it. So what better way, if they ever needed to, if LBJ, for some strange reason, never went off script. What better way to do that, to bring him back in line, than to tell him, you do what we say, or, you know, we have, we have your good buddy Mac Wallace's fingerprint in the FBI file from the uh, sniper's nest. So there, you know, you'll do it our way, because, you know, or we will, we will uh, throw you under the bus with this fingerprint. You know, that would... That would work. A lot of people, independent of me, have come up with that scenario, and I think that's the most reasonable scenario. Given the evidence, given where the evidence stands right now, you do not have to go beyond the evidence to say that, because having his print planted, that is a logical, reasonable reason to plant Wallace's print where it was found, in the FBI file of latent prints. And that's that's bad enough. That's bad enough. That's That's the conspiracy at work. And this has been Richard Bartholomew, the author of The Deep State and the Heart of Texas. He's the co-founder of the Center for Deep Political Research, which can be found at cdpresearch.org. Richard, thank you very much for these three episodes, and we look forward to having you back. But thank you for sharing your work with us. You're more than welcome. The pleasure's all mine. I'm S.T. Patrick. This is the Midnight Rider News Show, and we'll be right back. This is Jeff Worcester from the Center for Deep Political Research. For more on the work and mission of the CDPR, as well as the research that started it all, listen to episode 55 of the Midnight Rider News Show. Well, folks, the establishment has struck again. As we're going to press with the show, today is July 4th. This is the day that Richard Bartholomew's The Deep State and the Heart of Texas is to be released. Yet, on Amazon, it now says, Suppressed. Yes, I'm not making that up. It absolutely uses that word, suppressed. In a move the publisher has really never seen before, Amazon is holding on to the book. So on its release day, if you can believe that, the book is not yet being sold. But if you need to know how important Richard's work is, this should be a hint. Keep checking Amazon for specifics, and we'll also keep you updated here. Now, I want to wish everyone a happy July 4th, whatever you think our independence was, is, or currently means. I still hope that you and your family have a blessed day. I hope that you reflect for a moment about what freedom means to you and why we've all allowed it to be chipped away at law by law and court case by court case. And I hope that the next year is filled with reading, education, activism, and care. From the other side of the mountain, on the best side of midnight, I wish you peace. You can contact S.T. Patrick by email at midnightridernews at gmail.com. Join us on Facebook at Midnight Rider News Show. 
Follow ST Patrick on Twitter at MWN underscore ST Patrick. We are LinkedIn at S period T period Patrick. And don't forget to follow Midnight Rider News on your YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and many of your favorite podcast providers. This has been a production of MidnightRiderNews.com and ST Patrick. Copyright 2018. All rights reserved. We'll see you next time, and be good to the ninth.